Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. At a number of points in his pensées, Blaise Pascal is going to criticize the Stoics for, in his view, making some fundamental mistakes. He's not singling them out as the only people that are off. He's going to talk about plenty of other philosophical positions, philosophies as ways of life that, uh, in his view, kind of get something right and then get more things wrong. And you're going to notice that he will talk about Epictetus, the uh, great late or Roman Stoic, uh, who was being widely read at that time. He's also got in mind contemporary people of his own time who identify as neo-Stoics or who are influenced by Stoicism in one way or another. And I think that a really good place for understanding the nature of his criticism, which is uh, quite sophisticated, is actually in uh, the very short section 394. He tells us all the principles of, and now notice he's going to talk about not just Stoics, skeptics, Stoics, atheists, etc. So he's including more possible. All their principles are true. So is he endorsing a kind of everybody's got things right? No, he's saying that their principles are true, but they're making a fundamental mistake, which leads to their conclusions being false. So they're overall, here's how you ought to live. Here's my advice to you. Why? Because the opposite principles are also true. So each of these represents a particular way of getting something right and globalizing that, universalizing that, saying this is the only part that matters, and then thereby not paying attention to the opposite principles, not giving them their due, not incorporating them, and this leads to getting things fundamentally wrong. In uh, section 434 and 435, uh, there's some fleshing out of this. So he tells us um, that there's, there's two uh, truths of faith equally certain. The one that human beings in the state of creation or that of grace is raised above all nature, made like unto God and sharing in his divinity. The other that in the state of corruption and sin He's fallen from this state and made like onto the beasts. And then he says, these two propositions are equally sound and certain. And he you know, talks about how you could learn this through looking at scripture. Now, do you have to have a Christianity-informed religious viewpoint to grasp either of these principles? He says, no. And so in 435, he goes on and he says, Without this divine knowledge, what could people do but either become elated by the inner feeling of their past greatness, which still remains to them, or become despondent at the sight of their present weakness? So, you know, the, the human being is excellent and corrupt. So not seeing the whole truth, uh, he says they could not attain to perfect virtue, right? They, they can't have it all. They can have some of it, but not all of it. And he goes on, and he says, some considering nature as incorrupt, others as incurable, they could not escape. And now it's interesting that he's going to frame vice in terms of two main, uh, you could call them 
deadly vices, uh, capital vices, the ones that lead to the others. And one is not a surprise, pride, right? In Christian thought, this has been a big problem. You know, it's, it's viewed as like one of the fountains of, of sin, right? But the other one that he talks about is sloth or laziness, paresse in, in French. So he goes on and he says, um, they could not escape either pride or sloth, the two sources of all vice. Why? They cannot but abandon themselves to it through cowardice or escape it by pride. If they knew the excellence of human beings, they were ignorant of their corruption. So that allows them to avoid sloth, but they easily fall into pride. If they recognize the infirmity of nature, they were ignorant of its dignity so that they could easily avoid vanity, but it was to fall into despair. So you've got two choices, right? You can either focus on the infirmity, the corruption of human beings, and then you're going to be slothful. Uh, you're going to focus on infirmity and fall into despair, désespoir, right? Or you ignore that and you focus on the excellence of human beings, which is, you know, a, a true excellence. Then you uh, are driven by pride and that leads to vanity. So... These are the two choices. And then what does he say after that? Thus arise the different schools of the Stoics and Epicureans, the dogmatists, academicians, etc. So the Stoics are definitely on one side of this choice. Which side are they selecting? Well, you know, we see this in section 350. This is the fundamental mistake that he thinks that they make. The Stoics, it's actually titled that, this paragraph, they conclude that what has been done once, you know, at, at one point in time, can be done always. And that since the desire of glory imparts some power to those whom it possesses, others can do likewise. And he has a very interesting analogy here. He says, there are feverish movements which health cannot imitate. So he's actually going to, in just, you know, the next uh, couple paragraphs, he'll say the strength of a person's virtue must not be measured by their efforts, but their ordinary life, what it is that they're capable of consistently day to day. And so the Stoics, they look at human beings and they're like, wow, you know, that person is able to, you know, not fear death. Therefore, that's possible for all of us. You know, Socrates is a prime example in Epictetus's writings, who uh, Pascal is going to bring up immediately, right? He says in 350, Epictetus concludes that since there are consistent Christians, every man can easily be so. Now, obviously, Epictetus doesn't think that he's not paying attention to Christianity. He does mention, you know, uh, Jewish people at one point in the discourses, but he's not really engaged with the religion of Christianity. But the implication would be, hey, if this person, say a saint or you know, a martyr, or somebody who's doing something really extraordinary, if they could live in the desert for you know, 25 years constantly praying, well, everybody can do that. The Stoics aren't doing that so much with you know, prayer or matters that are more germane to Christianity, but they're doing that with a lot of other stuff saying, hey, if he can do it or she can do it, then I can do it and you can do it and we all can do it. We're all capable of it. And that's true in the abstract, right? But there's too much emphasis on the fact that we can do that and not enough um, on what holds us back, what, what, what interferes with us, the corruption of human nature. Uh, in 360, he'll follow this up by saying, what the Stoics propose is so difficult and, interestingly, choice of words here, foolish, lacking in wisdom. Now, wisdom is, for the Stoics, the, you know, virtue par excellence, right? And he says, he follows this up by saying something that's quite true of the Stoic school. The Stoics lay down that all those who are not at the high degree of wisdom are equally foolish and vicious, as those who are two inches underwater. Now, what's the reference there? So the Stoics, 
when they were talking about virtue and, and wisdom, they would say, listen, it's like an on-off switch. You're either on this side and you're wise or you're on this side and you're foolish. Even if you're making progress, you're making progress as a foolish person. You haven't crossed the threshold into wisdom. And it's like drowning, you know. You can be not drowning or drowning, and you can drown just as easily in two inches of water if that's going into your lungs as you can if you're in the whole ocean, right? So you could be very, very foolish and vicious over here. That's the whole ocean. You could be in two inches of water, but you haven't lifted your face up from it, and you, you die as a result. So, you know, again... Pascal is saying, you Stoics, you wind up being too extreme because you're not paying enough attention to, you know, this totality of human beings. A little bit later on in uh, 465 and 467, he's going to uh, talk about some traditional Stoic, let's call them dogmas, or sayings, or things that you should keep in mind. And so the first one in 465, he says, the Stoics say, retire within yourselves. It is there you will find your rest. This is probably familiar to anybody who's ever heard the phrase, the inner citadel, right? Coming from Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus say similar things. You, if you just withdraw into the realm of what you actually have control over, what you can be conscious of, nobody can beat you. And then Pascal says, well, this is not true. Others, by contrast, say, go out of yourself, seek happiness and amusement, like the Epicureans. And this is not true either. Happiness, Pascal says, is neither without us nor within us. It's in God, both without us and within us. So once again, he's criticizing the Stoics for getting, you know, emphasizing one side of the equation and missing out on the other when it comes to the human condition. Um, he also talks about Epictetus's, um, you know, distinction, which is uh, rather, uh, let's say the emphasis on it is unique to Epictetus. Um, the distinction between what is in our power or what is not in our power. And Pascal says, he did not perceive that it's not in our power to regulate the heart. And he was wrong to infer this from the fact that there were some Christians. Once again, you know, Epictetus isn't really engaging with Christians. But uh, if he were able to, if he was in the, you know, early modern period and talking with neo-Stoics, Epictetus would be saying, yeah, man, you, you can all do it. It's all within your realm of control. And Pascal is saying, well, no, the heart is more complicated than just the thinking or willing that we, you know, happen to do. And we don't always control precisely what the heart uh, wants, what it doesn't want, you know. And now, is this fair criticism? Could the Stoics respond to him at all? I, I think a case could be made that Stoics could, you know, make some response to this. But, you know, Epictetus is actually laying out a very interesting position. He's not saying, oh, Stoics are completely wrong. Uh, they began from mistaken assumptions about human nature. He's saying they didn't begin from enough assumptions or principles about the human condition, and therefore they wound up at erroneous conclusions just like all the other philosophical sects and pretty much all the other religions out there, except for, according to Pascal, Christianity. So these are his criticisms of the Stoic school and the neo-Stoics of his time.